to say thank you for what we've already heard. And I look forward to hearing from Michael, Svetlana, and Aaron more. Aaron, take it away. Yeah, so I'm going to do a lot less talking this time around, folks. Uh, I'm excited to share with you uh, some good, as I said, friends, uh, uh, mentors, and thought leaders. Uh, I encourage you to go find each one of them out there on the internet. I enjoy reading all their blogs and, and articles, and I think you will too. It's not going to be uh, what you or I write alone. It's going to be what all of us write and talk about together. So please include Michael and Svetlana in your reading list and maybe what you present to your students. With that, let me go ahead and ask each of them to uh, give a quick introduction as to who they are, where they're working, and, and maybe how they got into the artificial intelligence field. Uh, why don't I start with Michael? Uh, Michael, would you do your intro? Absolutely. Uh, so th thanks for uh, letting me go first, especially because uh, if Svetlana went first, uh, people wouldn't pay any attention to me whatsoever. Oh. <laughs> um, so, um, I'm Michael Conlon. I am the chief technology officer at a company called Definitive Logic. As Aaron mentioned, we're a consulting and system integration firm that primarily serves the federal government, especially the DOD. Um, and um, data analytics are central to the DNA of definitive logic. And one of the reasons I came here after leaving the Department of Defense was uh, the critical role that data and data analytics play for our firm. Um, at the DOD, I was the first chief data officer. It was my privilege to serve the department at all, let alone as the first chief data officer, and then the first chief business analytics officer of the DOD. Um, prior to that, uh, I have a long career in thought leadership, a, a range of chief technology officer roles. I've, I've worked in more than 20 countries and, in, and served firms in every major sector of the economy. Um, my, uh, my role um, coalesces around the idea of thought leadership, and that means just I've got to be current, up to date on the latest techniques and technologies. Uh, and for many, many years, the most interesting, fast moving techniques and technologies have been in the world of data. And it was my concentration in that area that created the opportunity for me to join the DoD. Um, I've worked with Aaron for a little while since we began collaborating while I was still in the DoD. And uh, I'm quite, uh, well, let's just say opinionated when it comes to some of the topics that we're talking about today. Uh, and have written extensively around the ethical issues associated, not just with data or data science, but with, with digital writ large. I'll pause there and let Svetlana introduce herself. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm Svetlana Sekular. I work uh, at the analyst company that is called Gartner. You may have heard about us because uh, we're covering all kinds of technology. My main area of focus is artificial intelligence. I am a mathematician by education. And as such, I have, um, I, I am actually rethinking my, my mathematical past in the light of AI. And I would be happy to share with those who are interested in math. I, I heard some comments and questions about math earlier today. But uh, fast forward, I've been at Gartner for 10 years. Before Gartner, I was a chief data officer also. I was a chief data officer at Visa in, on the commercial side. And uh, before this, uh, I was um, in all kinds of um, other uh, jobs such as uh, I live in Silicon Valley. I was in product marketing and product management in Silicon Valley. And uh, therefore I know a lot of um, latest and greatest news and ideas and thoughts from my former colleagues who are um, after many years are now everywhere. And before this, I was a consultant. I wrote expert systems in the last millennium. So I know enough uh, to, uh, um, to be dangerous in AI. I don't practice AI right now, but as part of my job, I speak with a lot of practitioners, both on the commercial side and on the public sector side. And uh, I speak with small companies and uh, startups. 
and I, I'm absolutely happy to share with you what I do. When it comes to AI also, we just completed our uh, big project where we interviewed the most, the companies among the most advanced ones who do AI ethics. And we're working on the digital ethics maturity model. I'm happy to share with you what we learned from the most advanced practitioners. So I hope uh, what everyone picked up from that is you've got uh, the former CDO from Visa and the DOD uh, on this panel. And so if that gets you uh, sitting up and taking note, uh, it, it should. Um, that's great. Let, let, me, let me go ahead and kick off with this. You know, I, I think it's fantastic that, that both of you come, you know, having been a chief data officer at Visa and a chief data officer for the DOD. You know, the question that I, that, that I, I'm not trying to be a fear monger or, or lead with, um, uh, lead with a sizzle story, but I would love for each of you to, to maybe share a caution or a cautionary tale, and it doesn't have to come from Visa or the DOD, it can come from anything you've read or perhaps from your own experience that you would share with this quorum regarding ethics or lack thereof in data, AI, and the humans doing it. Maybe first to you, Michael. Okay, um, I will touch on one that, uh, that that I think is instructive for all of us, and that is um, uh, there's a, a firm that published an, a trained AI algorithm that was meant to project recidivism among convicted felons. And when they rolled it out to a number of state and local government uh, justice departments, they bragged about the fact that their algorithm had 58% accuracy. Uh, and this was impressive to the judges and the prosecutors so much that they began applying the recidivism results. Now, as Svetlana and Aaron and everybody on this call knows, 58% is barely better than a 50-50 coin toss. And the reality is those people should have been deeply ashamed to even publish such an algorithm, let alone promote it and sell it to justice departments. Uh, and, and, and they should have been ashamed not to provide their confusion matrix that went along with the algorithm to show the fact that in the end, it under predicted recidivism among white um, uh, convicted felons by 50% and it over predicted recidivism amongst people of color by double. Um, and, and so it was an embarrassingly uh, inept a level of performance, an actual malpractice. If anybody should have gone to jail, it was the people that trained and deployed that algorithm, um, let alone the people that were being judged in, in the courts of law. Uh, and there's a long list of these embarrassing examples in the world of, of not just AI, but in the world of, of, of data analytics overall. In fact, there's a, there's a whole of shame website that I follow that, that keeps a list of these. Um, the reality of it is what I just described is a set of basic statistical issues that I learned about in the late 70s when I was in university. These are not new concepts and they're just basic concepts that aren't being applied. And when basic concepts don't get applied uh, and yet the results are used to make decisions about human lives, we have a significant problem in, in our society and in, in any society. Um, I, that's that's the, the example I'll bring up. We've got a longer list, but I'll bet Svetlana has even better ones. I don't know if I have a better ones. Um, maybe I will give you two cautionary tales, one with a happy end, with another one is un, with the unclear end. And I want um, to say that most of the cautionary tales are kept secret. People absolutely brag about their successes, but they don't talk about their failures. And sometimes they don't even see their failures. There are many questions that are very hard to answer and it's important to begin. One of the most famous cautionary tale, or tales with an actually unknown ending is the Microsoft Tay bot. Microsoft was among the first ones to release a chatbot 
for teenagers and they had very good intentions. They felt that teenagers are lonely, they need to speak with someone and they're edgy. And they announced to the whole world that they will release a chatbot that will learn online from teenagers. That's a question of data, right? Aaron spoke about data in his keynote. What it means, it means that instead of having well thought out data, they said, hey, teenagers, come and speak with this chatbot and you'll see how it learns online. And I wonder what can go wrong with teenagers knowing that somebody will learn from them. To make a long story short, they became racist and fascist and sexist, uh, you name it, within 17 hours or, or within 17 hours, Microsoft took it down. I hear this story quite a bit, but this story goes without a continuation. It was actually a blessing in disguise for Microsoft because they were the first public failure in the space of ethics and they were the first ones who started acting upon it. And what we see that a lot of acts, like in, for many people who are in cybersecurity, you know that companies or organizations don't act until something happens. So the same thing is in many cases with digital ethics, they don't act until something happens. So Microsoft, was the first one to start paying attention to responsible AI. And what they did, they combined, eventually they took the same technology, Microsoft uh, chatbots for teenagers. And, and it's a very sophisticated natural language processing and generation technology. And they add a very simple, not a very simple, but relatively simple layer it's a rules engine and the rules say, if you see anything negative, just ignore it. But because they had such a bad publicity in the United States, they deployed the same technology with the rules engine on top in China and they, under the name of Xiao Ice. And they, it, it currently has about 600 million users across Asia and they love it. And it became a host of a TV show several years ago. So that's a, that's a cautionary tale. And, and the short one, it, this is kind of a big and interesting story, but the short example of this is um, I heard from one organization that they used a very simple algorithm. It's not deep learning or anything called Lasso. It's not very, like when you develop anything, it's not very simple. This algorithm prunes highly correlated variables. Why I'm telling you this, because it's about education. The algorithm was trying to connect the parents, different features of parents with the successes of students. And the highly correlated feature two highly correlated features were parents' income and parents' education. And the algorithm dropped, dropped parents' education. So the response was the student's success is highly correlated with parents' income. So things like this are hard to notice and it requires a lot of deliberation to find the root cause and to give the right answers. That's why Aaron also spoke about explainability. Yeah, we let me, Aaron, if you don't mind, I'm just going to follow up because Svetlana said something that that, that, that I want to amplify, and that is often people deploy trained algorithms and don't recognize the problem or the negative consequences that they are creating as they do it. And in, in fact, um, don't even try to identify those consequences. And Aaron, this goes to the point you made in your earlier remarks about auditability uh, and, and about actually confirming uh, that your algorithm is not creating negative, negative consequences. And so, so here's, here's what I want to touch on. We all know that credit scores play an important role in not just getting loans, 
but in getting insurance, in, in getting um, uh, security clearance from the federal government, in getting uh, job opportunities outside of the federal government. And we also know that credit scores are incredibly noisy. Uh, the, the data behind them is incredibly noisy and it's particularly noisy for underserved groups like uh, minorities. Uh, the, the worst, of course, is, um, let's say, um, uh, business and entrepreneurs that happen to be women and minority. Um, they have one of the hardest challenges in getting, uh, in getting credit. And this is a problem that's existed since 1977. I mean, that's when the Community Reinvestment Act was passed of requiring banks to do a better job. Well, here we are decades later and it's still the same problem. Um, the, the, you know, the, just as a data point, since we're all interested in the world of data, the level of noise in the credit data for minorities, uh, the standard deviation of that noise is 2.2 times higher. So 220% higher for minorities compared to uh, non-minority groups. Dramatically higher level of noise in the credit data, mostly because of the scarcity of the data. Um, and yet here we are after, uh, what is that? Four and a half decades of effort to try to fix and the banks still are disregarding the level of noise in the credit report and still doing a very inefficient job of allocating credit uh, to, to applicants. Uh, so, uh, the, and the banks would say it's not their problem. I mean, uh, look, the, the, you know, the, the, the credit records are, are, are poor, not our problem. But, but in fact, it's all of our problem because all of those entrepreneurs are trying to contribute to the economy and we all need a vibrant economy. Sorry, Aaron, I get a little excited here. No, Mike, that's, Michael, that's great. And I promise we're gonna open it up to, to general uh, Q&A and, and put your uh, questions in the chat and, and we'll get to those uh, after 11.55, we'll roll we'll straight to that Q&A. But for now, I wanna continue to moderate this conversation and, and kind of go with, with where you all are leading. Uh, so, so Michael and, and Svetlana, you, you, you both shared some great examples uh, about, you know, uh, credit scores and ratings and everything like that. So, and, and, and Michael, the, the points you made on, on the noise and the data, so here we are talking about responsible AI. It is, you know, the term du jour, so couture throughout government and everywhere else. Is it really AI or is it something else? Is it data? Is it humans? Is it transformations? What, what would you say to that? It's always humans. The, and I was thinking, like I said, I was on vacation uh, for the last couple of weeks. And I was thinking a lot about AI and was reading books. And I was thinking that a lot of what we see is an interpretation. It's how, it's not necessarily how, a, what kinds of questions AI gives, but it's also how people interpret those questions. Mm -hmm. And people tend to interpret them. And people interpret, if you ask different people the same question and about the interpretations, they will give different interpretations. And when Aaron was answering your question about what you can educate, how if you can educate people within two years, you absolutely can. And Aaron gave you fantastic pointers. I was thinking that soon enough we will have some sort of a AI occupation. Uh, that the, I call human in the loop. A person who is uh, interpreting AI, a person who is the last resort for AI, because this kind of interpretation, people tend to put the meaning where the meaning is absent and AI is in essence, it's an algorithm and it's the data. The data is chosen by people the data is curated by people. It's often obscure. It's so often of low quality. I can give you a lot of examples of our, about low quality data. It, the people who choose the algorithms, for example, teams tend that, that work together for a long time tend to develop self-perpetuating approaches. What works fantastic in the previous project is being applied to the new project, even though there might be some uh, new ideas or some better ideas for this new project. And that's why we saw that the best performing teams are the ones who combine internal and external skills. 
by hiring new people or by bringing in consultants so that they will make sure that they don't have those self-perpetuating approaches. So there, there are many of those aspects where humans are bringing in a lot of their own experience in a good way. And that's, and Aaron also pointed to test and testimony. Testing is pretty much absent in AI, in, in the AI practice. And I'm not calling you for developing testers because testers have to be the same kinds of data scientists that develop it, but paying attention to critical thinking, to deliberation, to best practices, and to validating what's out there. We at Gartner speak with practitioners and what we see, by the way, in our surveys as well, and we run a lot of survey, surveys around the globe and those are large scale surveys. Uh, we saw that top five skills in the data science teams, in addition, so a data scientist, a data engineer, a machine learning engineer. So science and engineers, uh, engineering are two complementary practices. And two others are the very top one is a net business roles. And the role of the business is to ask the right question and to spot the right answer. And this is an iteration. So you can't ask the right, often you can't ask the right question from the first attempt. And only people who understand the business can spot not only, but often people who understand the business can spot the right answers. And this requires critical thinking and collaboration skills. So those are soft skills that you can also teach in your data science courses. And last, uh, and the last fifth role in the data science team, it's still small, but it's rising to Aaron's point is user experience because Data science uncovers the answers first time ever, but how do you express them? For example, how do you express the answer without a screen? It's user experience, but it's not necessarily graphic design. Or how do you express a, a result of a very complex algorithm to an athlete who is currently practicing? So these are user experience questions that will become more and more pronounced. So, so Michael, let me, let me ask you a question kind of based on what Svetlana shared there. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, a future of having an AI interpreter or AI jockey or husbandry or rancher? How, how is that going to evolve? And, and where do you think that's going to be in five years from now? Well, I, I think the interpreter is probably the most critical piece of this. I mean, we're, we're, we're into multiple layers of abstraction. I mean, just something as simple as a neural network where you might have um, a million layers in a, in a, you know, deep in a million nodes wide, uh, and you have all of these uh, vector numbers in, in the nodes. It's very, very difficult to help a human being understand that. Uh, the interpretation explainability is central to all of the progress that we need to make. In the end, without it, um, and, and I believe you used the expression transparency, um, without that transparency to how the algorithm is making calculations. I'm not, you notice I don't say decisions because algorithms don't make decisions, they make calculations. Uh, human beings make decisions to Svetlana's point. Um, how it's making those calculations becomes very, very difficult to understand. Uh, and yet, anytime you put an algorithm into production and it begins to be used by humans for decision making, it has an impact on the human beings, which means ultimately it's going to get its stay in court. Every algorithm that gets put in production will get its stay in court. It might be a legal court, it might be a court of public opinion, it might be both, but it's going to get its stay in court. Uh, <laughs> we all know that one of the classic things you're trained to do in any kind of a business ethics class is to apply the headlines test. Um, would this look good in the headlines and would you be happy to see it there? Well, 
you know, that level of explainability gets really narrow when you're dealing with a headline. Um, so the, the, the role of AI interpreter um, reinforced by disciplines and tools to provide explainability is going to be utterly critical because sooner or later, you're going to have to explain it to a jury if you're peers, because in the end, it's the human beings that are going to be held accountable for it. Um, all of the others are, are important and they're complementary roles, but if we don't get the AI interpreter first, the others are going to have a hard time doing their job. Uh, I like what you said there, Michael, about uh, every AI or algorithm or, or data will, will have its day in court. And so knowing that we're talking to, you know, a, a community of so many college, community colleges who, who are seeking to develop the right kind of curriculum, what should we be doing to prepare for that day in court or to perhaps be better prepared with our data and AI and algorithms for a future day in court through education? What should these educators be considering and doing to have a more favorable outcome or time on the witness stand. Svetlana, what do you think? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think from the educational perspective and uh, from the educational perspective, it is about figuring out, so, or preparing people to ask questions and ask, taking a situation, taking a situation, and, and that's what you will be doing in the next part of the workshop, I suppose, right, Aaron? Yes, so, but taking a situation and asking questions, and there are no wrong questions to be asked, and bringing in all of those, um, and, and communicating, because multidisciplinary or, or diverse teams and diverse means different things in different situations. The more eyes you have on the answers and on the situation, especially in the preventative situations, such as we're not developing it until we discuss what it means. Like what we have seen, I want to say, I want to make a footnote right now that AI is still very new. And what is happening in AI right now is like, like what was happening in software decades ago, that first people learned how to program and they made those programs work. And only then they started testing. And it turned out that testing is a huge part of software development. And then security came in place. And AI doesn't have either. They, it doesn't have testing and it doesn't have security. These are all new, but they will be coming and they will be based on the foundations. A lot of foundations with which, which you are already teaching are applicable to AI. Now, AI to me is about three things. In addition to the foundation, it's about trust, transparency and diversity. And this applies to data, algorithms and people. So trust in data and algorithms and in people's choices. The same is transparency about how data originated, about what algorithms are doing, give or take, and about decisions that people make. And diversity applies also to data diversity of data. It, it is about the intended use of the data, but choosing the right data. So Michael said that we have horrible data for credit scores, for example. Choose the right data. Find something else. We right. saw that a lot of algorithms broke down during the pandemic because the data changed. It means that these algorithms were using maybe not the best data to start with or not very diverse data to start with. And we saw that, uh, for example, lenders were adding on uh, for small businesses, some information like food traffic in the area or uh, demographics, uh, or, um, pick up, um, curbside pickup and so on. So, and Th those, those are very important aspects. Diversity of data is huge. And there should be someone who is accountable for data 
selection and curation for every single use case. Then diversity of algorithms. Like I gave you an example, not only machine learning, maybe rules-based or rules engines, in addition to machine learning and diversity of people. Invite people or learn your students to collaborate, to find the right people, to discuss the problems and to ask the, que the questions and collect those questions, revise those questions, refresh them, but keep asking. That's the, the, the core of ethics. So Michael, let me ask you a nearly impossible question. We, we know that the, the DOD or the Navy is starting a, a new national community college. Let's just suppose you're the dean for a day. And, uh, and, and you've been you know, asked to, to ensure that, a, that, that there's a hearty program ensuring what we're talking about today, responsible AI mm -hmm. is, is infused, that there's an ethical uh, approach to what is being taught. What are some, what are some protocol or, or what are some plans or programs or best practices that you would like to see this new community college doing uh, by your edict? And then, uh, and then you use them on it. Yeah, okay, so it, it, it's a great question. And I'm gonna give you a short answer first. And, and the short answer I just dropped in the chat window. And, and it's this, STEM is wonderful, but it's nowhere near as wonderful as STEAM. The reality is if we only teach people quantitative uh, approaches and we only think in terms of scientific and engineering disciplines, if we only think in terms of mathematics, we're missing the, the human element. And the human element is where judgment comes in. It's where we understand the need to look at consequences. It's where we understand that not everybody looks like me, that, that there are other people with other needs and other viewpoints. And, and that in fact, cognitive diversity, uh, which is part of what Svetlana was talking about a few moments ago, is not only critical, but we can mathematically show that the higher the cognitive diversity in a given trained algorithm or team, the more accurate, the, the sorry, the higher the validity, accuracy, precision, and recall of their, their outputs, and the lower the level of negative consequences are. Look, it's not a coincidence that when the IEEE put out their ethically aligned design paper, that it was 294 pages long because they were covering the depth and breadth of human theological and philosophical systems. If we exclude that from the curriculum, then we will have failed every person that participates in that curriculum and every person that those graduates serve. It's critical that we start with a broader perspective and we don't allow our science graduates, our engineering graduates, our math graduates, our computer science graduates to only live in a narrow domain, because then they're never going to be able to apply those critical thinking skills that, that Svetlana was talking about, because their perspectives will be way too narrow. They need to be exposed to broader groups of people who are not like them and thought processes that are not like the ones they grew up with. That's where I would start. That's an amazing response. And Svetlana and Michael, we, we could go easily for another hour here. I would, I would love to, to have you both for lunch sometime and, and rest in Leesburg, wherever. Uh, that'll be a great, uh, a great meetup when we do. Uh, Svetlana is currently on vacation, so when you get back. Um, but to wrap things up here before we turn it out uh, for, for uh, general q and I wanted to ask you, what are, uh, what's a recent book, a column, or an author recommendation that you would make uh, to this group? Something that you've either read or another long-standing book that you suggest we reread or column you advise we check in on. So Svetlana, is there a, a great book or column or author? Yeah, or I, I'm, I'm reading a book which is called um, Gödel, Escher and Bach. Oh, great book. Yes, uh, I, I got it. So I carried it on vacation. It's heavy, it's this thick. <laughs> can, can you put it in the chat box, please? Uh, yes, I will type. So well, later. It, it is, it is early thinking. It is an early thinking about um, artificial intelligence, but it gives you a perspective of the foundations. And why I started reading it because I, I was thinking about my my math past. And one of the striking things for me that I remembered is a um, actually uh, uh, some of the. Uh, 
consequences of a Gödel theorem, uh, sorry for being too technical, but the consequence is that any complete system can, can, contains at least one statement and its opposite. And I kept thinking about it when I was thinking about how people develop AI nowadays because they're developing it in a very simple way. And AI needs, and I feel also that AI uses a fairly straightforward math and the same algorithms. And there should be also a whole generation of mathematicians who are educated with AI in mind. That's that, that's a great recommendation. Uh, thanks for putting that link in the window, Mark. How about you, Michael? What, what would you recommend? So I'll recommend the book Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. A uh, very entertaining yeah. book. Takes a, 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 a quite a different slant on, on philosophy and theology, uh, characterizing uh, capitalism as a religion, by the way. Um, very useful way of looking at, at the mental models that are quite different from the, the, the typical treatment. So I'll drop that in the chat window as well. Thanks for that. Uh, I think we always love book clubs and book lists. And, and the one that I would add to, to these great recommendations from Svetlana and, uh, and, and Michael is uh, Weapons of Math Destruction uh, uh, by Kathy O'Neill. Uh, it's, it's a fun read as well. Um, so with that, uh, you know, we could go on a lot more. I think we touched on maybe like two of the questions I had, but uh, really outstanding insights. I, I learned a lot. I know we've got about 15 minutes, if that's still good for both of you, uh, of q and I'd like to open it up now. Michael, are you available? I'm, I'm actually about to run out of time, unfortunately. I am available. I want vacation. <laughs> I'm yeah, enjoying Michael, it. Michael and I are both at another conference right now, and Michael is actually a keynote uh, up at MIT. So, um, oh, cool. I, Michael, why don't why don't we give you a parting thought, and then and then we'll let you go, and yes. we'll spend a lot on myself. Okay, so so my parting thought is to say thank you, Aaron, for for inviting me, and Svetlana for letting me be on the panel with you. I learned a lot from you, and and thank you to all of the participants. I, I think that the the mission you're undertaking is critical to the the future of our country and the future of our citizens. So so thank you for helping us tackle this important issue. Let's go get it. All right, Michael. Have a great. I'll see you over at the other conference. Bye bye. And, and Michael, nice you, I hope Michael. you. I hope you'll be willing for us to reach out to you too, because well, we need people that are experts like you folks to help guide us. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, Michael. All right, everybody stick around. We've got Svetlana for, uh, for another 15 minutes or so. So who wants to, uh, who wants to volley that first great question? Well, I have a question if, if it's all right. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm reaching out. This is perfect for you, Svetlana, because of your mathematical, uh, you, you have a wonderful background in terms, in terms of mathematics. And we're putting together an AI program, uh, two year, and we're weighing the options right now in terms of how do we want to handle the math? Uh, there, there's so much, we, we can require, you know, for instance, calculus and linear algebra, uh, but as some other programs have done, but we're wondering about making it math optional in the sense that they at least have statistics, they at least have college algebra, and then they have the option of filling in their curriculum with the other, the upper level math or uh, other technical courses. And the idea is some people don't necessarily plan on going further than this two-year degree, and they want to focus on the technical, they want to be technicians and use these technologies and assist with the data preparation. But, but we're still trying to find our way in this. It's a difficult uh, dialogue to have. We want to make sure that we're offering the opportunity to take more math. I think because yes. some students want to go on to the four year and then continue on. But what do you think? Is it is it reasonable to consider an option where there is, where we're not requiring uh, the upper level math and we uh, offer- Absolutely. 
Uh, I'll I'll go I'll mute myself and I'll let you talk. But thank you for uh, for whatever perspective you provide. I I think uh, the math is not required. We have seen a lot of practitioners, and I should say that uh, two years course, if people take it seriously, and it seems like data scientist is a well desired job, they can learn a lot. They don't have to learn math. I, I, I know tons of practitioners who, who are self-taught. There are a lot of, uh, there is an incredible organization called Fast AI, for example, which we just recently uh, showcased as a cool vendor in Gardner Cool Vendor Reports. This is a company that, that has a goal to educate non-mathematicians how to be data scientists. And it's their own framework and their own course that they developed on deep learning. So it is doable. Um, math is a very nice to have. And I, I think it's more that, like you said, if you offer some additional courses and people are eager uh, to do it, it's great. If not, so your job would be maybe to refer them or to explain, I personally, I, I, I learned uh, math many years ago. I personally regret that they didn't teach us. Uh, they taught us very theoretically and they did, didn't teach us how it's related to, to practice. I hope it answers your question. Wonderful feedback. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm listening. Uh, my computer is running out of battery. I'll go um, plug it in. Sounds but good. You can keep Thank talking. You. I hear, but uh, you will not see me. I'll add. Okay. I'll, I'll add to that real quick uh, while she plugs in her battery. Uh, I wasn't planning on saying anything, but I'll say, you know, Adam. Earlier, I enumerated uh, several uh, jobs that are, or positions or educations. That, uh, that are in high demand. And uh, for user interface and user experience, you know, little math, more so on the design, but still the understanding and appreciation for ethical considerations in that rendering of AI is gonna be critical. So I think it's all to varying degrees. And like Svetlana said, um, now there are ways to, to just ensure that the human has got first the ethical considerations. Uh, so Lana, now that you're back, I wanted to come back to the question that was uh, that was surfaced at the beginning, uh, which was, uh, are there any standards uh, or government regulations uh, for AI that's all in one place? Uh, if I, I think you're, you're here to say yes, right here, right? Or no? I don't, I'm not aware of such a place. Uh, by the way, we are trying to collect some. And if you look at some of our research, we refer to it. But other than this, it's hard to, to it's more, there, so there are two types of regulations. One type of regulations is that says, I'm a regulation about AI. And by the way, many of those regulations are not enforced, like uh, European Union's uh, Artificial Intelligence Act. It's a hundred page document it, people like it because at least they see the, a direction, but it's not enforced. And another one is a set of regulations that seemingly, not seemingly, but about something else that applies to AI. Uh, an, an example would be, uh, for example, FTC. The FTC recently published a blog post that says, here is a list of consumer protection regulations that absolutely need to be taken care of when you develop artificial intelligence solutions. That's great. I, I put the uh, national uh, and the NSC AI's uh, site there in the window. If you all haven't downloaded and read, uh, that's available for you. I wasn't aware of the FTC's report. I'll go check that out too. So it, it, those are blog posts. Mm -hmm. So and, and so one of the blog posts was a blog post of the FTC director who, who expressed the intention about AI. Again, it's not enforced, but many companies and organizations like it, like the fact that there is some regulation because they don't want to do anything that will be deemed illegal or against the law in the future. 
they want to put their work into something that is acceptable. And by the way, that's why a lot of software like large big tech companies are lobbying the government. They, they often don't care about what's in the regulation, but they want to have a regulation to say that they're compliant. Yeah. There's a, there's a great point in here made by, uh, by D. Willis, Adam, I'm guessing. Um, it says, is there a, a life cycle for AI, data analytics, and data visualization? So like an end-to-end -end process. You know, we've heard a lot about yes. CRISP, DM, and other things out there, Svetlana. Uh, what are your hopes? Do you think there's ever going to be a standard framework, or is it? Uh... Absolutely. A absolutely. And uh, I, so we published one of the frameworks with three cycles. It's, um, it's published in, in the relation to the rising role of uh, MLOps, machine learning operations. By the way, that's another job that you can um, teach people. MLOps, uh, it might have a different name, but it's monitoring AI in production and retraining models. It's an engineering work that is absolutely necessary because data scientists are not the ones who would be, uh, who are trained and who are willing to monitor AI in production or follow the development cycle. And what is currently happening that there is a huge push from everywhere to find some resemblance of AI of the AI development cycle to the, to the software with the software development cycle because software development cycles are very well known while people are inventing things in AI and that's why the current effort is, what do I do about production? But the next effort would be, I guarantee you, is what do I do about testing? And the very next effort would be, what do I do about data? And because data for AI is very challenging and there are very little tools that allow, it, it, people call me and ask, and, and uh, AI people and make statements like, like data is not ready for AI. And I usually say that it's AI people who are not ready for data. <laughs> uh, Svetlana, what are your thoughts? Do we need to, uh, would an AI project or process team leader ever be needed? And could that be a non-technical person or is it better yes. a technical person? Uh, a great question. It, there, there are two roles. One is a project manager and another one is a product manager. It doesn't have to be a technical person. It has to be a communicator and it has to be a critical thinker. This is the role that is accountable about um, around the use case or for the use case. We, re we recommend accountability for each use case. It means asking questions. For example, we have seen recently um, a company that was developing a procurement model for supermarkets. Ask the question, do we, if we use the data we have, do we do a disservice to, uh, to communities that uh, have a lower income because we, we procure the, to the supermarkets something that they usually buy and that is inexpensive, but that limits them, uh, it, that limits their exposure to something that they might want to be exposed to, for example, organic produce or something that they don't even see in their supermarkets? It's a very difficult question, by the way. But these are the questions that need to be asked as, as part of this cycle. And there should be someone who facilitates the, the, this question answering and finds those diverse people to answer those questions. I give you the, I give you the example for, for the model that is already developed, but these questions are being asked on every single stage. What kind of data do we select? 
Do we have a right set of people to select the right algorithms? Do we trust what we see as the outcomes? Who do we involve in iterations to ask the right questions and to find the right answers? And how do we deploy it in production? And how do we retrain it in production? So someone who is accountable for the use case end to end, because the key for AI is AI is the first discipline that is probabilistic, not deterministic. And it means that the answers are not 100% correct and they will never be 100% correct. That is the core. Svetlana, final question, and then I'm going to kind of synthesize a lot of comments that I see in the field, and okay. folks will, will rotate to a very quick break, and then the use cases. Svetlana, if you're available to stick around for use, dropping in on some of these groups as a use case, that'd be awesome. But what I want to synthesize from, from a few comments in the chat here and things we've also heard is, is you, you know, we've pointed to the, to the need for a person to be able to see and ask the questions at the nice time and interval. But tell me a little bit more about the organizational construct. And I say this for how you and I met and how you and you even uh, support uh, uh, some other activities that you and I are involved in. What more can we say than just the onus being on an individual? How does it come together at a corporate level? And I'll leave that pretty open, but I know where you're probably gonna go. You know, um, I was also thinking about it because uh, uh, Google just let go yet one more person. And, and, uh, and it, it, Corporations are gigantic entities and, and they have their lawyers and the bigger the corporation is, the more legal, and for a good reason, it's more about the risk management, about compliance, about accountability. So corporations do their things, but it's also about who they hire and how they hire. And this is a big, this is a big thing too. Do they hire individuals like Google does, or do they hire teams? Do they hire, um, do they hire a, a large diversity of people, or do they hire the same people over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. And, and there, there are many other questions that you can ask maybe during the workshop, yet there, there is a difference. At the same time, I see that Google has a very advanced digital ethics program and they do ask questions and they learned probably the hard way, I'm guessing, but they learned to ask questions and to deliberate in advance. And there are many things that, that they're doing that are very ethical. So it's not black and white yet. I think the core of it is not necessarily in AI, but in the hiring practices. For example, we heard from the city of Chicago that no matter how new and how different data science work is or job is, they have a standard set of questions that they ask during the interview because they want to compare apples to apples. And they said that that's the best way of hiring a data scientist. Mm -hmm. that, that they tried all kinds of ways, but this is the, by far the best. So again, it depends on the corporate culture more than on anything else. And at, and at ECS, we rely on uh, you know, living aloud with our vision and our goals of uh, ensuring ethical practices and data and AI, and then also having a, uh, an ethics board that meets monthly with accountability to the CEO and our shareholders. So I think you'll see more of that kind of governance come in amongst uh, organizations, schools, companies, and the like. Well, Svetlana, you know, the Q&A was great. Thank you for all who's participated. Uh,